as the last epidemiological study designed to cover a clinical trial is a prospective biomedical or behavioral research studies on humans it is designed to test the safety and efficacy of drugs interventions treatment or therapy among other clinical trials a randomized control trial provides the most compelling evidence on the causal effect of a treatment drug intervention or therapy as on the disease or human well-being the um, most important design feature of a randomized control trial is uh, probably that it is an experimental design where one or more variables called a an independent variable or exposure um, are manipulated by the experimenter in a highly controlled environment to see its effect on the other variables so that other variable is the outcome measure or dependent variable and this is the only design to be used to establish a causal relationship between those variables the randomized control trial is known to minimize bias and contamination from confounding variables for a study to be an experiment, there are several design components required to ensure the validity and reliability. Among those components, we will talk about three of them, a need for a comparison group, replication, and the random allocation. But to illustrate why those components are needed, let's take a hypothetical study where you want to test the efficacy of a drug to cure or treat a disease. So you developed um, this drug called Miracle Cure right, and give this drug to a patient suffering from unknown disease. So after taking the drug, the patient seems to get better. now the question is then how do we know if the recovery is because of the drug because of the drug not something else when we see the patient gets better so there may be other reasons behind the recovery than the drug for example it may be just all psychological so to eliminate other alternative um, explanations of experimental results then the hypothesized effect of the experimental manipulation, um, in this case drug, we need a control group. So that was our research hypothesis. So we give the, uh, give the patient drug and looks like it actually treat the patient. But what if, right? So we have this counter hypothesis. So if our research hypothesis is correct then if we remove the drug then the patient should stay sick right so here is our patient again and we just leave the patient uh, without giving them anything and they should stay sick right? so um, this way we can make sure that it is the drug that cure the um, you know whatever disease this patient had so um, the selection and the use of proper controls are critical to ensure whether the experimental results are valid there are two types of control groups positive or negative control group uh, which is shown in this counter hypothesis so that is actually the negative control group and negative control group um, is um, basically there is a no uh, manipulation or you can include inert manipulation expect to show no or little effect or change where there should not and the negative control can guard against the effect of expectation and or the regression toward the mean um, that may confound with the true effect in the experimental group so you probably heard about placebo before um, a placebo 
the word is actually coming from Latin, meaning I will please, um, is a fake treatment, um, tablet, drop, pill, injection, and so on, um, which is administered as if it were a real one, but um, which has no therapeutic value other than the psychological feeling of being better. On the other hand, nocebo effect is the adverse reaction experienced by the patient who receives nocebo. Um, so, in general, placebo effect refers to the positive effect experienced when a placebo improves patient's health-related condition when the patient believes that they are being treated. In fact, placebo does work for real to a certain extent, and the effect has shown um, that larger pills uh, works better than the smaller pills, color pills works better than the white pills, and surgery works the best uh, compared to injection and compared to pills. By the way, you can also fake surgery to make it look like a, make it look like a real one too. Um, so this works, the placebo effect works even when the patients know that they were given a placebo. And because the reactions from placebo result from a patient's expectations or perceptions of how the substance or the treatment will affect the patients rather than being caused by the real effect from a biologically active component of the substance, you need to show that the size of the effect of the drug or treatment is at least statistically significant over and beyond the placebo effect to get the drug or treatment approved. And the only way you can show this is to employ a placebo-controlled group against your experimental group. And another phenomenon that is quite closely related to the effect of placebo is called the regression toward the mean. So this is a um, statistical phenomenon that arises when the initial measurement of a random variable is extreme from the average, the subsequent measurement of the same variable will tend to be closer to the average or mean of the measurement. Um, so we can think of disease as a kind of an extreme health condition uh, away from the overall health. So when an intervention or drug is applied to treat a disease, any improvement, uh, if there was any, can be uh, the real effect of the intervention or the drug or simply due to the regression toward the mean. So for example, we all have ups and downs and good days and bad days. Our health also fluctuates with time. So let's say that the uh, horizontal axis represents the time passage and vertical axis uh, represents our health level. And also the blue dotted line represents our overall health level. And, and you know, in a moment, a curve will uh, be shown representing our health hovering around the um, overall health. So when you are here, right? So this is on top of the curve. You're the happiest person in the world. You're on top of the world. You feel like you can do anything, be anyone. But alas, as time goes by, your health starts to deteriorate. It's going down the hill. Now you don't feel so good and it doesn't stop there. You're getting depressed and your suicidal tendency increases. You're close to the rock bottom and you get sick. But you're not quite dead yet, but you feel like you're going to. Can't take it anymore and you feel like you gotta do something, otherwise you will really die. So you pour the little dose of the strongest painkillers from your stash into your mouth and crash. And after a while, you feel better and you thank to the pill you took, assuming that it helped the recovery. 
But wait, did it really? Um, you know, people typically seek out medical help when their symptoms are at worst. So <clears throat> you catch disease somewhere here. And you get sick. And then this is the point where people seek out um, the medical help, right? But then, you know, how do we know if the recovery was, um, you know, due to the effect of the drug or simply the regression toward the mean? I mean, there is no way we would know without a proper control group. If we buy into this regression toward the mean, then you will get better even if you don't do anything, unless this is a terminal disease or an instantly killing heart attack. So combined with this regression toward the mean, you will feel much better even if what you took was just a sugar pill. And therefore, the best way to combat this phenomenon is to divide the patient's group uh, randomly into uh, a drug or an intervention and a control group that does not receive the intervention. So if the drug really worked, then at least the drug will shorten the uh, recovery by pulling this part of the curve upward like this, right? So at least it should um, reduce the time it takes um, um, to suffer from the disease, right? So this is only possible, this comparison is only possible when you have a negative control group. Now we know the importance of a control group. However, a negative control group is not typically used whatever possible because of the obvious ethical reasons. Just imagine that you're sick um, but assigned to a negative control group in an experiment. So basically you'll keep suffering from the disease without being properly treated throughout the experimental period. It is like you're deserted in pain on purpose for the sake of the experiment. So a positive control is typically used when there is already an established treatment such as gold standard known to work. The outcome from uh, this group expect to show uh, an effect or change where there should be right, because this is already established um, and it can be used to assess the uh, validity of the experimental uh, group. So for our miracle cure experiment, we can compare the effect of the miracle cure against the control group given a generic painkiller like uh, you know, paracetamol. So here are the um, possible conditions in a controlled experiment and their respective ex expected outcomes from each condition. So on top, we have um, experimental condition where we give this patient um, a miracle cure. And the expectation from this condition is that the patient will get better after this um, miracle cure, right? And we have positive control condition where we give them a veterinary painkiller that we know that it'll work up to a certain extent. So the expectation is again, uh, the patient should get better. And we have placebo control. Uh, so placebo control is um, kind of a negative control. And when they are given a sugar pill, right? And the overall expectation is that the patient will stay sick, right? Or they're not get better. They 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 not get they they don't get better um, at least compared to uh, the positive control or the experimental condition overall, right? And finally, negative control. Um, so you just give them nothing, and if you do that, then they should stay sick, right? Overall. Um, another essential component of an experimental design is the replication. So you would not generalize your results based on a single patient, right? Um, and people would not believe your results anyway, either from an experiment with n equals one. So 
you need to have as many patients as possible to make sure that you know what you have is for real and reliable. In addition, we know that measurements are subject to variation and uncertainty. Um, they should be repeated with many subjects and experiments should be replicated to estimate the true effect of treatment, uh, which is uh, represented by the accuracy and to strengthen the um, experiment's precision and generalizability. Last but not least component of an experimental design is the random allocation, which is the process to make the allocation of the sample to the respective groups by chance alone so that it is unpredictable who gets what. So this is the only way to guarantee that any differences in the outcome measures are due to the effects of the experimental manipulation rather than to some unknown underlying differences between the groups. So this process, um, the random allocation, is more effective with a large number of samples. And allocation bias undermines the causal inference between the treatment and the observed effect. So uh, we talked about this counterfactual ideal comparison group already in core study design. So to make sure that the effect of drug is real, you need a control group. Um, but to make this comparison absolutely, absolutely fair and square, you want to have a control group that was um, exactly the same as the experimental group, um, except that they would not get the treatment Right? But then we know that this is a counterfactual ideal because it is impossible for the same person to be both um, control and experimental group at the same time. Alternatively, um, we can have a lot of sample and split them into the respective groups using random allocation, hoping that their individual differences and any other extraneous variables we cannot control are spread between the groups more or less evenly to establish the baseline comparability between the groups. So here we have a sample with different colors representing individual differences such as age, sex, and other variables we cannot modify. With random allocation, we hope that these individual differences are spread more or less equally over to each group so that they can, have, uh, they can be evened out on average. So this is what it means by how random allocation replaces the equality of individual with the average equality of groups. We cannot achieve the equality of individuals in each group in real life, and that's why it is called a kind of actual ideal. However, we can um, approximate um, this um, equality of individuals with the average equality of groups through random allocation so that we can start the experiment from an equal footing. So think about this uh, MPOD experiment uh, from the weekly data analysis task where patients were randomly allocated to either the lutein only group or uh, to the lutein plus omega-3 group. And when we tested their MPOD levels before each treatment begins, it was hypothesized that their levels were expected, expected to be the same, right? So it was quote unquote expected that way. Otherwise, we cannot start the experiment if they turned out to be different. Um, just imagine the situation where we found a difference in MPOD between the groups after the patients are treated with the drug. If the baseline MPOD was different from the beginning, right, then how do we know if this difference is coming from uh, uh, the baseline or the actual difference in the effect of drug? So, I mean, this difference, I mean the difference after they are treated um, in MPODs, right? So now the true effect is contaminated by the difference from the beginning. And if, if that happens, then the experiment is just completely wasted, no matter how significant the treated difference was. 
So it is very important that you check these baseline characteristics before you start experimental manipulation to make sure that what you got at the end of the experiment is due to the difference in the manipulation, not by other factors you did not want or expect. There are a number of different designs you can use to run a randomized control trial, and here are some of them. Um, so first, the parallel group design is the uh, most common design used for uh, randomized control trials, where each participant is randomly assigned to a group, and all the participants in the group receive or do not receive the respective intervention only. Um, on the other hand, uh, the participants in um, a randomized control trial with crossover design, each individual receives or does not receive an intervention in a random sequence over time. And finally, um, in factorial design, each participant is randomly assigned to a group that receives a particular combination of multiple interventions. So here is a simple flowchart of a um, typical parallel randomized control trial with two arms. So once you select your experimental population, you enroll study participants who are willing and eligible. Then your study participants are assigned to their respective arms according to the whatever randomization scheme you used. And all the participants in a group receive uh, or not um, the corresponding treatment only, which is a typical example of between subject design. Then they are followed up until the outcome and their data are analyzed. So this is a most commonly used design, uh, the randomized control trial design. Um, about 80% of all randomized control trial is designed this way. And with this design, typically uh, one treatment question per trial is asked. Because random allocation is so important in randomized control trial, um, there are additional procedures to protect the original randomization scheme after the random sequence is generated. So this is necessary to guard against the uh, selection bias and other confounding uh, variables, uh, both of which are supposed to be minimized by the very randomization. So first, um, it is protected from both patients and clinicians by the procedure called the allocation concealment. So the allocation scheme is concealed in an opaque envelope with a sequential number on it until the trial starts with the actual allocation of patients. And another uh, protective procedure of a uh, randomized uh, control trial is a blinding, which is a procedure um, to keep patients, experimenters, or outcome assessors from knowing which intervention was actually delivered. So it is different from the allocation concealment in that blinding is not always possible. For example, if a uh, randomized controlled trial involves a treatment where active participation of the uh, patient is required, such as in physical therapy, then patients cannot be blinded to the intervention. And also it is different from the allocation concealment in that blinding is an additional uh, procedure after the trial commences, whereas the allocation concealment is the uh, procedure before the trial begins. And there are different levels of um, blinding. So an open randomized control trial is in a non-blinded uh, randomized control trial, whereas a single blinded um, randomized control trial keeps the information regarding the experiment from either the patients or the experiment. And finally, double-blind. Um, 
and that is the most secure level of blinding and that actually keeps the uh, information from both uh, the participants and the experimenter as well. So this is a, another design of a, a randomized control trial called crossover design. So in contrast to parallel design, um, in crossover design, each subject acts as his or her own control by receiving at least two different interventions or drugs, such as drug A versus drug B, as shown here, or one of the um, treatment can be a standard treatment or a placebo. So they receive um, these two interventions at different times during the trial. In uh, many cases, all subjects in crossover design receive the same number of treatments. So in the beginning of the crossover trial, um, subjects are randomly assigned to either treatment and followed up for a period. And then they're given some time without any treatment called a washout period before uh, the treatments are switched to make sure that the effect of the drug or treatment from the previous period disappears so that it won't affect the effect of the drug or treatment in the next phase. Naturally, this type of design is suitable only when neither of the interventions or the drugs uh, has long-term effects. However, a crossover design has two advantages over a parallel study design. First, uh, the influence of confounding is reduced because each participant is acting as his or her own control and you know in parallel study even when randomized it is often the case that there are unbalanced or uncontrolled effect modifiers or covariates in a controlled crossover design um, such imbalances are minimized and secondly unoptimal crossover designs have a greater statistical power so require fewer subjects than the parallel design so in this sense, um, a crossover design can be more economical compared to parallel arms design. And finally, factorial design can test the effect of multiple treatments and their interactions at the same time uh, with the um, uh, marginal cost compared to the um, parallel arms design. So remember the yellow 10 experiment that was in fact an example of what's known as two by two factorial design where the effect of two different substances are uh, tested over two different times it is called two by two in that there are two factors that's what they call so basically two independent variables which are drug and time so these two by two, so two factors, so that's we have two by two, and then for each factor, we have two levels. So in terms of a drug, we have two different drugs, lutein and lutein plus omega-3, and we have a two different time period to test the effect of this drug before and after. So there's another two um, within subject levels, right? Whereas we have two different between subject levels in terms of drug, right? So that's why this is called two by two design. And um, this is a mixed design in that we have one between factor and one within factor. So in principle, the typical statistical analysis used in factorial design is ANOVA, um, the analysis of variance, but we broke this factorial design into four different um, t-tests. Um, to facilitate the understanding of the study design. So in analyzing the um, randomized control trial data, there are a number of things to consider. Uh, first of all, uh, the use of fancy statistical analysis can only be justified when these groups are analyzed exactly as they were randomized without any violations to the original randomization scheme. But even then, you also wanna make sure if individual patients follow the exact protocol 
as stipulated at the uh, from the outset of the study then you have the most valid data to analyze the true effect of the treatment if there is any however as you can see from this flowchart there are violations galore all over the place pretty much everywhere including loss to follow-up uh, or the contamination of the treatment effect from non-compliers so there are quite a few things um, you want to uh, take account into when we analyze the data from a randomized controlled trial so in general there can be three different ways to analyze the data from a randomized controlled trials and among those uh, the intention to treat analysis is at the heart of the um, randomized controlled data analysis uh, randomized controlled trial data analysis and it is a very basic and principled approach where every subject is included who was randomized according to the original randomization scheme. So intention to treat um, analysis ignores non-compliance, protocol deviations, withdrawal, um, loss to follow-up, and anything that happens after randomization. So intention to treat analysis is usually described as once randomized, always analyzed. And this analysis is also referred to as as randomized uh, as opposed to as treated. So with this uh, analysis, um, baseline comparability, control for known and unknown confounders, and the, the original statistical power uh, of the study population um, are preserved. So results from uh, this analysis the intention to treat analysis may reflect the real world treatment effect in every everyday practice where patients do not always comply with the treatment regimen in this sense um, intention to treat analysis is is equivalent to comparing treatment policies rather than the pure effect of treatment themselves Alternatively, you can deal with the um, compliance issue at the analysis stage by analyzing the data only from the patients who completed the entire trial following the protocol. So this type of analysis is called per protocol anal analysis, and this analysis can provide the net efficacy estimation of a new drug or therapy under ideal circumstances. However, this type of analysis is not recommended because the original randomization is violated. And also, excluding data from non-compliers effectively shrink the original statistical power uh, resulting from uh, the sample, smaller sample size. So if possible, this analysis should be avoided. Sometimes you'll find um, some non-compliant subjects who were originally assigned to the control group but in fact received treatment during the follow-up or vice versa. So in this case, an option is to analyze the data according to their actual treatment status regardless of which group they were originally assigned to. And sometimes this analysis is tried when intention to treat analysis did not show a positive effect in a statistically significant way however analyzing the um, the data this way just to totally beats the purpose of uh, running the rct the randomized control trial in the first place because the advantages um, entertained by randomization is now completely ruined again um, you should stay away from this type of analysis um, also when possible So um, this diagram will summarize how groups are analyzed under each analysis scheme at the end of a randomized controlled trial. So first we have study uh, patients, right? And then they are uh, randomly allocated um, with the randomization scheme. So according to that scheme, they are split into uh, treatment group and the uh, control group. So that is the 
original assignment. But you know, at the end of the experiment, the actual outcome will be a little different. So we see that um, there are a number of people who are treated as stipulated, but some people are not treated as stipulated. And likewise, under the control group, they're not supposed to be treated, but you know, some of them just um, don't follow the rule. So when you have this kind of actual outcome, um, the intention to treat analysis and the data will be analyzed according to the original assignment. So whoever um, is assigned to the treatment group, then their data will be analyzed as the uh, original randomization scheme. On the other hand, the patients who did not stick to their original assignment are simply excluded, right, in the um, per protocol analysis. So um, you only analyze uh, the data from the subject who actually um, follow the rule. And then finally, um, the original assignment is ignored in the as treated analysis, right? And then participants are, uh, uh, the participants data are analyzed with respect to the actual treatment outcome, right? Um, uh, during the follow up. So this is the difference between the three different approaches of analyzing the RCT data. Um, so in running an AA randomized controlled trial, there are some serious ethical issues uh, uh, involved. So in general, the ethical considerations are much deeper in running a randomized controlled trial than other observational studies because in RCT, investigators is uh, deliberately manipulating variables that might have direct consequences to the subject's well-being and safety. So the researchers uh, must have some kind of evidence that it may be of benefit, for instance, from lab work or animal studies or from other observational epidemiological studies. Otherwise, there would be no justification for conducting a trial. Um, Another ethical issue um, is um, involved with the participants in the control group because they are not treated. So they should be treated um, once all the data has been collected and if the treatment show a beneficial effect. So it is a researcher's ethical duty to maximize benefits and to ensure that all participants have access to those benefits when possible. So in running a um, randomized controlled trial, even the uh, random allocation has some bearings on ethical issues. So in case of say two arms parallel design, where one arm is a positive control and the other arm is a new treatment group. Um, and if the researcher is almost sure that the new treatment group will fare much better than the positive control before running the RCT, then it would raise an issue whether or not it is ethical to randomize the patient. So basically, the intervention trials um, using the randomized control trial um, are ethically justifiable only in a situation of clinical equipoise where there is a genuine doubt concerning the value of a new intervention in terms of its benefits and risks over the conventional treatment. So equipoise is um, defined as the point where a rational informed person has no preference between the two or more available treatments. And another most debated issue is whether it is ethical to use placebo because it is basically a deception. So with respect to this issue, Benjamin Friedman suggested five conditions when a placebo control may be justifiable um, 
and these conditions are when there is no standard treatment and when there is uh, the standard treatment is no better than placebo and when the standard treatment is placebo and when the net therapeutic advantage of standard treatment called into question by new evidence and finally when the effective treatment exists but uh, it is not available because of the cost or um, shortage in supply. Now, these points made by Friedman is reflected in the recent revision of the Declaration of Helsinki, a set of international ethical principles by which any experiment involving human subjects should abide. So here are some uh, good things and bad things about randomized controlled trial. Um, the, um, the good feature of this uh, randomized controlled trial is the randomization, the random allocation, right? So this is the um, kind of a minimal guarantee if the experimental result is valid, right? And also um, multiple outcomes can be studied for any one intervention. And this is also considered the most reliable form of scientific evidence. However, um, you know, typically uh, running a, a randomized control trial is very, very expensive. And the average cost of running uh, an RCT is, um, you know, $12 million, the US dollars on average. And the return on the investment may be also high. Um, so that's uh, it is justifiable to uh, run the RCT with a high cost. And also it takes just a, quite a long time, it takes um, at least a several years to finish data collection. Um, so it may not be suitable to uh, study rare outcomes or the um, disease with the long induction, unless you have already large pool of subjects, right? So um, these are, and also uh, the uh, randomized controlled trial is actually uh, raising uh, important ethical issues. So it takes a lot more precautions than other types of research. So um, as a summary, um, this pyramid-like uh, diagram is called hierarchy of evidence, which is reflecting the relative strength of research designs. So from the case report at the bottom of the pyramid to randomized controlled trial, um, at, at the top, the strength of evidence for testing the relevant hypothesis increases. And in general, evidence from the experimental designs are considered stronger than uh, from the observational study designs.